Welcome everyone to our Riffum Science Symposium. We're going to start in a moment as our guests continue to gather here in the virtual space. As a reminder, you can ask questions at any time using the Q&A or chat function to the right. Any questions that we don't get to during this main stage, we're going to respond to them during our related breakout session uh, immediately following this. Please also feel free to take advantage of our science posters. Uh, we have lots of downloadable content for you today, uh, as well as um, a section where you can go into the virtual booth and visit our Fragrance Safety Resource Center, downloading many more critical documents um, and work that the team is doing here at RIFM. If you haven't connected yet today in one of our lounges, uh, networking with some people, including the RIFM team, please also take advantage of that before the end of the day. We've already been enjoying so many of the different connections that we've made as a team with you and um, look forward to making more of them as the day continues on. All right, I think most of us have gathered at this point. Uh, for over 55 years, RIFM has been evaluating the safety of raw fragrance materials. Many of the materials used today have been assessed at one point over the history of RIFM, but what continues to change is the science. And our team aims to integrate that latest science as we assess the safety of the materials. And with that objective in mind, our team has been taking a fresh look at naturals and tackling the complexity of their safety with the latest science and resources. All of these efforts have led to development of the four-step process that you see here on the screen today, and that's published in our NCS criteria document that came out earlier in 2022. I'm Danielle Botello. I'm the Safety Assessment Manager at RIFM, and I really just have the honor of supporting the team of scientists that utilize this four-step process on a daily basis. We've learned a lot as we've begun its implementation, and so today I want to share an overview. Focusing our attention on steps two, exposure, and three, component-based analysis. And then I'm gonna hand it off to my colleague, Maura LaBelle, who's gonna take us through a case study focusing on skin sensitization. The RIFM four-step process for NCS evaluation covers human health and environmental exposure. This is a robust approach um, to safety, looking at seven different endpoints or areas of study, everything from genotoxicity to skin sensitization, respiratory toxicity, developmental and reproductive toxicity, repeated dose toxicity, photo safety, and environmental toxicity. Exposure data on volume of use is populated every four years by the IFRA team and is the backbone of our environmental risk assessment. Data for human health exposure is gathered through consumer habits and practices data, as well as concentration survey data from the fragrance industry. I'll just pause to note this was said earlier in the day, but just in case you're just now joining us, uh, all of the materials that RIFM evaluates is populated essentially by that if or volume of use survey. If volume is reported, then it goes on to our to-do list to evaluate the safety of that material. And RIFM has developed a six-year timeline for the initial first round of evaluation of NCS and utilizing the stepwise process, which means we hope to be complete with that first round of evaluation by the end of 2027. Now, really, where do we begin addressing all these complexities? And that's with step one, data. And you may be assuming that's strictly assessing the toxicology data, but before we can do that, there's actually another really important piece of data that we have to address, and that is the plant taxonomy. Assessing the data for plant-derived NCS really requires looking at similar taxonomy, which will lead to similar composition. And when we're describing chemical similarity and determining prioritization of the NCS, we need first need to look here at the family and genus, and look at the relationships between the plants and their evolution, essentially that botanical nomenclature that's going to help us determine, again, similarity, but also prioritization. The generally what I would describe as citrus materials has been the focus of our pilot program, as well as the first couple of years of assessments that we've been reviewing with the expert panel for fragrance safety. We're continuing to evaluate the NCS by family and um, 
mints, pines, lavenders, in addition to the citrus, will be dominating our timeline through the end of 2023. In general, most toxicology data rich materials in our inventory, and they're also some of the highest tonnage materials as reported on the IFR volume of use survey, which again defines the RIFM inventory. And that survey is actually circulated every four years to the IFR membership. Over 900 NCS have been reported on that survey. And the citrus family of materials. Um, as we'll just check, continue to generally describe them throughout this presentation, was the largest reported group with the greatest amount of toxicology data available. Additionally, uh, it's of note, FEMA has already published open access information, including composition for both the citrus and the mint derived materials. Citrus as the largest family of materials has been, um, again, our pilot and initial evaluation group and about 50% of them have already been assessed and approved by the expert panel for fragrance safety with some of follow-up um, testing or additional research need being needed. Um, and again, the mints, the pinings, and we hope as well as the lavenders will come under to review um, by the end of 2023. And while this may look small, four families of materials, it's over 60 materials represented in the first round, and they also represent 43% of the NCS 2019 volume of use. So it's a very large percentage of materials circulating in use by the industry that is represented by the evaluation of these four families. And again, was part of how we intentionally designed the prioritization. Substance ID, composition, and data gaps though, are remaining challenges to our process. While they might be the most data rich families, in general, just comparatively, they're data poor to discrete individual materials that have already been evaluated by RIFM. Now, RIFM is actively clarifying substance ID and composition in partnership with the IFRA, NCS task force, and member companies. The backbone of a RIFM safety assessment for material composition is the typical composition of materials described in the IFRA IOFI. NCS Complex Ingredient Constituent Compendium, a mouthful to be sure. It's the CICC or affectionately known as the kick to some. This is what's formally known as the IFRI OFI NCS matrix. And to ensure consistency and harmonization on NCS characterization, we're utilizing this. Um, and we really want that harmonization to for on the characterization of NCS to be um, for the constituents to allow the sameness check and related activities under various groups, um, IFRI, OFI, and RIFM activities, we really want it to be consistent and harmonized. And so at the end of our symposium, um, during the last breakout session of the day, we're actually going to be joined by the experts, some of our IFRA colleagues, as well as a member of the IFRA NCS task force. And they're gonna elaborate on the process to derive that typical composition, as well as the partnership with RIFM to make sure there's clear transparency and understanding of what is a bit of a complex process. Now, we're looking at clarifying substance ID and chemical similarity, and it's important to note that even two substances with the same plant taxonomy may differ in the number of components and or the percentage of the similar components. So to examine similarity, dissimilarity, we're going to need to look at both of those things as well as the plant part and the substance processing. So it can be quite complex and we're test driving analytical protocols with multiple partners and additional information on some of the partnerships and research projects all are available in our science poster virtual exhibition hall. And I encourage you to go there and just download the content. I'd also encourage you to check out some of the breakout sessions around our research today that would have more information on these projects as well. Now, once the team has exhausted the efforts to mine the data of a single NCS, if needed, we may need to move into step two, and that's exposure-based waiving. This step is a deviation from our discrete material process where we understand more about chemical similarity when you're looking at just single materials. And in those cases where we've done read across in the past, um, chemical to chemical, um, we've just had a greater understanding. That is not necessarily the case here. Um, for natural complex substances. Now, we've obtained data, though, on over 900 NCS. 
And so we know a lot about the exposure of these natural complex substances. You may have already been in a presentation today learning about the concepts and our research around TTC or DST. That's threshold of toxicological concern and dermal sensitization threshold respectively. These are well-documented and established tools um, that help us look at low level exposure values. Um, and it's based off of measured data. And we know that below the limits set by TT, for TTC and DST in various cases that there's um, no appreciable risk. And so we are going to implement these tools to make sure that we can utilize them in our conclusions around safety of these materials. In fact, over a third of the NCS reported um, on our concentration surveys, their data falls below the most conservative TTC limits. The big takeaway message for fragrance materials, whether you're talking about NCS or you're talking about a single discrete fragrance material, is that the exposure is very low. And this is why we're able to so easily and seamlessly integrate the concepts of TTC and DST. Now, if we can't make a conclusion about the safety using steps one or two, you may be assuming that we need to generate data. Um, the citrus family is the most data rich set of the naturals that we've come across, but still 50% of those materials lack target data on the whole NCS. Additionally, we're going to recognize that there might be some obstacles to obtaining sample and even determining chemical similarity of that sample to the typical composition. That said, we absolutely have process in place to do so to obtain the sample and test the whole NCS to fill data gaps when needed. However, instead of jumping immediately to testing, RIFLM is actually going to first analyze the components of an NCS. And the majority of our safety conclusions at this point across various endpoints are derived from step three, a component-based analysis. At least one or more endpoints are using step three in our current safety assessments that we've done to date. Many NCS components are fragrance or fragrance-like materials. And we can leverage our extensive knowledge on these individual parts to provide safety conclusions on the whole substance. The great thing about leveraging the knowledge of NCS components that we've already looked at in that single discrete ingredient space is that they've been reviewed by the advisory committee as well as the expert panel for fragrance safety. And you've heard, if you've been a part of our presentations throughout the day already, a lot about our Fragrance Safety Resource Center, where we transparently open access, upload all of our data for download, where you can see the safety conclusions made on thousands of materials at this point, and really understand that we've looked at this space extensively. And so while we may not know everything about natural complex substances, there's a great deal that we do know because we've looked at the chemical space so extensively that makes up those naturals. Now, most often, I'll be honest, we're getting asked about the implication of standards and sensitizers concerning our NCS assessments. I'll pause though, because I think there's an important distinction to make here. RIFM does not set standards. The standard setting process is part of IFRA. RIFM simply is providing data that populates the standards. And on the screen right now, what you're seeing is a mock-up of data um, for maximum acceptable concentrations, which we affectionately call MAC values in-house. And while RIFM does not set the standards, I'm just gonna reflect on a moment that after conducting our pilot and completing evaluation of many families of NCS, no new standards have been needed to be proposed. And we actually don't anticipate a need for a windfall of new standards. And that's primarily because RIFM collects concentration survey data, which feeds into the CREM RIFM aggregate exposure model, providing the exposure data that is the backbone of the safety assessment for human health endpoints. And we ask for exposure of materials to be reported added as such, plus the contribution from naturals. And so essentially, when you look at these maximum acceptable concentration levels in an assessment for a natural complex substance, you're then also going to look at the derived exposure for a component. 
Now, because we've published extensively on individual materials, um, and often those individual materials would be ones found in natural complex substances, if a standard was needed, a MAC value was already set and should cover the use and already be accounted for. And you can see here on the screen for a component that we've determined and looked at the derived exposure and compared it to the maximum acceptable concentrations, and it actually falls below those MAC values. And we anticipate that the derived exposure should always fall below the MAC values. Later on, I'm going to introduce my colleague, um, Maura Lavelle, who will walk us through a very specific example found in our most recently submitted assessment, NCS assessment, in greater detail. And she's going to really drive home and illustrate this very specific point. Again, as it's been one of the most frequently asked questions. Now, all of that said, if steps one through three are exhausted and a safety conclusion cannot reliably be made for one or more of the endpoints, we are going to explore testing strategies. And those testing strategies will vary very much so by the endpoint. Um, genotoxicity, for example, having a very well established battery, even within the mixture space that we can utilize versus respiratory toxicity, where we would not have a very well defined battery. That said, as an aside, uh, when we're looking at local respiratory toxicity for the naturals, the exposure, again, is so low, and we have been able to utilize step two in every NCS assessment thus far and would not anticipate it being problematic um, to move, have to move beyond step three um, in our initial evaluation of the inventory. Now, before... Um, Data evaluation testing needs really can be determined, though, whether you're looking at step one or step four, we actually do need composition first. The composition is critical, and that's provided by the IFRA NCS task force. And so once we've gone through and exhausted that, um, we will go ahead and determine if testing is needed. And in order to stay on track, both composition and timely sample acquisition are critical. I drive this home today because I first want to thank all of our partners through the IFRA NCS task force who provide us composition, as well as any group that's been um, responsible for supplying sample. The entire process will ultimately be driven by the delivery of these things. Internally, RIFLM has optimized our processes to make sure that we can work this steps one through four in an efficient way. And it's only through getting the composition timely, getting the sam samples timely, and making sure that we work through with our contract labs effectively and efficiently that we'll be able to complete this work on the timeline that we've proposed. Now, I did mention at the beginning of our time together that we published our NCS criteria document. And that publication with this four-step process reflects advances in risk assessment approaches of mixtures and toxicology methodologies. Now, that approach specifically includes a citation that our source of the composition comes from the CICC, an outline of the effects of botany, plant taxonomy, and processing for substance identification of the NCS, a decision tree for determining the chemical similarity of NCS for prioritization, as well as the stepwise process for human health and environmental toxicity that we've been running through right now. Overall, our criteria document uh, for NCS evaluation includes everything that we've talked about. And I encourage you to go to our science poster, um, virtual space, that exhibition hall that's here on the Hublo platform. Click on the Fragrance Safety Resource Center booth when you go there. And you're going to find a direct link to our resource center, which houses the criteria document and all other RIFM publications for free download. This is just a wealth of information and one of the best resources you can utilize and pass along as well. As with all RIFM safety assessments, NCS are going to be reevaluated on a five-year basis in order to include any new data or um, toxicology methods of assessment. Um, this is going to include a review of the exposure data, which we have talked about being critical, especially in cases where threshold waiving measures um, were utilized. Remember, um, so many of our, I think 99% of our current safety assessments, one or more endpoints are using things like TTC or DST. 
this is critical that that data be re-reviewed as the exposure data is updated to make sure our safety conclusions hold. We had a whole presentation on how we maintain um, our conclusions earlier in the day. If you didn't catch that, please feel free to reach out to us with questions and we'll get you information on how you can know if something's been updated and maintained. We also acknowledge that there's some challenges that remain with our current process. And so I just wanna run through a couple of those right now. The two primary ones are chemical similarity um, and variation at, and non-volatile materials. Essentially, I'll just keep driving home, substance ID is critical. We get that there's going to be batch to batch variation. Um, there's going to be processing variation. There may be sometimes a concern of stability. To the left here, you see a very involved decision tree. This is actually included in the NCS criteria document. So when you download this, I believe this is figure one, and it walks you through how we begin with our current understanding to address chemical similarity. Now, I also wanna note that we do talk a little bit of, about batch to batch variation in the introduction of the NCS criteria document. And one of the things that we cite is actually a product of conversation from our NCS processing core team, where we talk to industry experts and they explain to us a technique called communal batching. This is a common practice within the industry that helps smooth out the batch to batch and crop to crop variation. And you can observe modification, but very often batch to batch over 10 to 20 years, there's a very good correlation. And the most important factors are the botanical source and process. So even if you have some variability, you can't account for all impurities. And more often than not, they will be very similar. Again, um, in part due to this communal batching process. There's also many different things, um, measures put in place to make sure the stability of the materials is maintained over time. Um, in the storage of batches, uh, it's often topped off with nitrogen. Most often in other instances, argon and CO2 gas are used. It's um, heavier than air and therefore displaces the air. And so a lot of this is just outlined in um, the discussion of the introduction of the NCS criteria document. But again, we recognize there are challenges and we don't have all the answers quite yet, but we do know a lot. And so we like to talk about um, and say what we do know, even though we don't have all the answers yet. We also have um, non-volatile materials that are sometimes a very high percentage of an NCS. And so again, we have research programs that are being developed to better understand the non-volatile portions of a material, but we're also working on what can we say about the portion that, especially the volatile portion where we may know a lot, and then what can be said about that non-volatile portion. And simply, putting out transparently in the literature what we do and do not know, um, and making sure that we develop research projects to address the unknown. It's a huge cornerstone of how RIFM continues to operate. And again, I encourage you, please download some of the research project posters which talk about some of this work. Um, again, I'll highlight chances too. Um, that's a project that is spearheaded by our principal scientist, Aurelia Lipchinsky, um, focused on environmental toxicity uh, is what she does day to day. And she has some great analytical projects um, now in the works and collaborations to help us understand some of these portions of material specifically within the environmental space, which is strictly a component based approach. And so Aurelia has a breakout session today. If this is something that's of interest to you, she has posters, join her breakout session. It would be excellent. I want to give a little bit of context to um, where we stand today. And despite the challenges that we, I've just outlined, we continue to evaluate and publish what the current science does tell us about NCS safety. We've sent 36 drafts to the expert panel for fragrance safety. Again, those are from the Citrus family, the first round of materials uh, in both 2021 and 2022. The first approved NCS has been submitted for publication. At this point um, today, we're still waiting for peer reviewer comments, but as soon as we receive them, we anticipate to turn those over quickly. And um, we had been hoping that we would have those out and published um, by the end of the year. But again, it's completely um, dependent on the reviewer 
blind um, independent peer review process. And so it may be coming in early 2023. We would make um, announcements um, to the membership and broader audiences through all of our communication channels. Because again, we want our work broadly communicated. We want to be transparent with everything that we do. And so we re that really does require us making sure we get the science out there as it becomes available. You would be able to see this assessment once it's published on the Fragrance Safety Resource Center. So the first NCS um, assessment that was submitted, so you can take um, a look at the resource center in the weeks to come when it does become available is Pettigrain Mandarin Oil. And you can see the cast number as well as the RIFM ID there. Um, I would just say that uh, if you're looking for updates, you're definitely going to want to um, put in your information at the bottom of the Fragrance Safety Resource Center page. You can sign up for updates. Um, also be sure to connect with Gary Sullivan, our communications manager today. Make sure you're on the RIFA mailing list. Um, more than likely you are at this point if you've signed up for uh, this particular um, day to be with us at the symposium. But um, we wanna make sure that this uh, information is getting out broadly. So again, please direct other colleagues and other interested stakeholders to the Fragrance Safety Resource Center and make sure they're getting connected so that again, when things like the Pedigree Mandarin Oil Assessment become available, that's getting into the hands of the people who would need to use that data the most. I'm going to provide now at this point, before I close out, a little bit of color for the very last breakout session of the day, where we talk about what's caused, called the second phase NCS. And that'll become clear what we mean by that by hopefully the end of the next couple of slides. And then of course, there'll be maximum clarity if you attend the last breakout session of the day. So um, from my point of view, I just wanna rewind back to 2018, where we had a RIFM NCS workshop um, that led to a policy at that time where NCS for which the IFRA NCS task force would not be providing composition, it would be sourced by the highest reported users contacted by RIFA. So essentially we would ask, this is oversimplified, but composition, is it available in this kick, the CICC? Yes, it's the backbone of the RIFA safety assessment. No, then we would go to the highest reported users. And that was about 300 materials. This is years ago, and this was a decision that was previously made. And I'm going to talk about how that's not the case today. Because a concern was raised that nearly a third, those 300, were so highly specialized that an assessment couldn't actually be done to represent what was in commerce, that many materials were being reported and described by a single ISO code and RIFM ID. And you'll remember today our process says that essentially a typical composition um, needs to be um, provided to RIFM um, because that serves as the backbone of our NCS assessment. And so really, um, we've split the NCS now into two rounds because a typical composition um, cannot currently be determined due to high variability, specifically the variability in processing methods of some of these NCS. And many materials, again, are being described by a single ISO code and RIFM ID. So the first round, is um, currently underway. That's any NCS that has a typical composition provided by the NCS task force. We are moving forward with that evaluation and writing those assessments and sending them to the expert panel for fragrance safety. But there's a second round of NCS that have been defined by the IFRA NCS task force as naturally sourced materials processed in such a way, folded, rectified, etc., that a typical composition cannot be reliably established by the IFRA um, NCS task force using the usual industry practices. These NCS will not be considered by RIFM in the first round of safety assessments, but will be addressed in a second round to enable additional data to be determined. Um, and so we're going to talk about these in detail in the breakout session. But I want to note, RIFM will continue to gather data for second round NCS in partnership with the IFRA NCS task force while also continuing to write and publish on all first round NCS. All the fine details will be provided during 11.30 a.m. Eastern Standard Time breakout section on second round NCS. The experts from IFRA as well as an expert from the IFRA NCS task force will be present. I highly encourage you if you're this is an interest, you want to know what these materials are, how they came to be a second round material, what is first round versus second round, you want to head to that breakout. 
at the very end of today. And so again, I just wanna drive home. There are challenges that remain. And despite those challenges, our process is vigorous and um, robust. And so when one step is not enough to make a conclusion about the safety of a material, we're often building upon each one and putting them together to combine them to make a strong scientific conclusion around the safe use. And so again, we're going to take this robust process and continue to integrate the most cutting edge science and do that in a transparent way as we continue to tackle the challenges that remain in the NCS space. So we have a breakout coming up right after this. I think you'll probably have a couple of minutes where if you need to take a bio break <laughs> or um, uh, do some other things, you can. But before you do that, I'm actually gonna hand it over to our senior associate scientist, Maura Lavelle. Um, she's going to close out our time today before the breakout, and she's going to present an NCS case study for the skin sensitization endpoint. So please stick around for the second half of this main stage. After that, we'll have our breakout session. And I just want to thank you all for your time and attention today. And so Maura, take it away and outline um, the uh, NCS process that you've undergone for looking at skin sensitization for our recently submitted NCS draft. Thank you, Danielle, for that great overview on natural complex substances. Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Mara Lavelle, and I am a senior associate scientist at RIFM, working within the skin sensitization endpoint. Like Danielle, I will also be talking about NCSs today, but I will be doing so within the context of evaluation for skin sensitization. I am first going to provide a brief overview of the skin sensitization endpoint, and then I will show you a step-by-step -step approach on how we would evaluate an NCS. As Danielle mentioned, you have the ability to ask us questions at any time using either the question or chat function. We will try to answer your questions during our presentation. However, if we do not get to your question by the conclusion, you have the ability to meet with both Danielle and I in a breakout session that will immediately follow after the end of this presentation. So like we would with the assessment of any material that we evaluate, we begin the evaluation of natural complex substances for skin sensitization by collecting and evaluating all available data. Before I get into the types of data we focus on within the skin sensitization endpoint, I thought it would be good to first review how and where we obtain the data we use during our safety assessment process. Using a tool called the Toxicity Data Search Engine, or TDSE, we can quickly search for numerous materials in various databases. Our main source of data is the RIFM database, which is a large collection of data on fragrance and flavor ingredients, including natural complex substances. We can also find data in other sources, such as ECHA REACH dossiers. RIFM not only includes primary data in our weight of evidence approach, but also exposure data. Exposure data are primarily obtained through the CREM RIFM aggregate exposure model, which incorporates survey data on the use of fragrance ingredients from the fragrance industry. Going back to the types of data we will evaluate, there is in silico data, in vitro data, in vivo animal data, and in vivo human data. I will start with discussing in silico data in the context of the skin sensitization endpoint. According to the Skin Sensitization Adverse Outcome Pathway, or AOP, protein reactivity, which is based on chemical structure, is the molecular initiating event of skin sensitization. Most fragrance ingredients can be evaluated through in silico tools, which assess chemical structure and chemical reactivity. At RIFM, we primarily use the OECD toolbox, ToxTree, and Oasis Times SS to determine how likely a chemical is to react with skin proteins. Next up, we have in vitro data. Various in vitro assays address key events one, two, and three of the skin sensitization adverse outcome pathway, DPRA, P53, 
PPRA and KDPRA address the first key event, which is protein binding. The second key event, the activation of keratinocytes, is addressed through the keratinocense, leucense, and census assays. And lastly, HCLAT, USENSE, and GARD address the third key event, the activation of dendritic cells. These assays with the green check mark above them are assays that have OEDC guideline studies, and more specifically, they are used together in a two out of three call as outlined in OECD 497. Before I begin with the animal data, I want to reiterate that RIFOM does not conduct animal testing for skin sensitization. However, the animal data do exist, so we do evaluate existing historical animal data as part of our safety assessment process. There are several in vivo animal studies that assess skin sensitization. I just want to quickly discuss three with OECD test guidelines. The first is the Bueller test. This is a guinea pig test with repeat topical applications. This approach is outlined in OECD test guideline 406. The second is the guinea pig maximization test or GPMT, which is also outlined in OECD test guideline 406. This includes intradermal injections as well as topical applications. The third is the local lymph node assay or LLNA. This is outlined in OECD test guideline 429. The LLNA provides quantitative information on sensitization potency expressed as an EC3 value. The EC3 value is the concentration of the test chemical required to induce a three-fold increase in lymph node cell proliferation. The RIFM inventory has three main types of in vivo human data. These are diagnostic patch test data, which primarily come from dermatology clinics, human maximiz maximization tests, which can be very helpful in providing a no observed effect level or NOEL or lowest observed effect level or LOEL. And before I discuss the last type of human data, I want to stress that RIFM human studies are never conducted to test skin sensitization potential. Human testing that is conducted by RIFM for skin sensitization is only ever conducted to confirm a NOEL. Due to this, RIFM has chosen to rename RIFM conducted human repeat insult patch tests or HRIPTs as the confirmation of no induction in humans or CNIH. Once again, this is due to the confirmatory nature of this test. For a CNIH to be considered sufficient by RIFM standards, it requires that certain criteria are met. First, 100 subjects are needed to complete the study. Next, the test material must be diluted in a vehicle that is a mixture of ethanol and DEP. Typically, this will be three parts DEP to one part ethanol. This vehicle is also used during the study as a vehicle control. We typically will also use an additional negative control such as saline or distilled water. RIFM also uses an occlusive patch system, specifically the 25 millimeter hilltop chamber for all RIFM conducted studies. The protocol for human testing within skin sensitization was outlined in a 2008 paper, but as a result of a pilot study conducted by RIFM from 2019 until 2022, we are going to be updating that protocol. This was discussed in more detail in one of our 9.30 a.m. sessions this morning, but if you missed that session, the poster is available for download on our website. If anyone wants additional information on how human con testing is con that is conducted by RIFM is changing, please look at that poster or feel free to contact me. My contact information will be available at the end of this presentation. 
So since this presentation is about natural complex substances specifically, let's get into the RIFA process to assess an NCS for skin sensitization. As I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, the evaluation process begins with looking at all of the existing data and determining whether or not that data is sufficient. If there is enough data on the whole NCS to be considered sufficient, then we have to decide whether the available data show that there's any evidence of sensitization. In the event that there is sufficient negative data, we may be able to conclude the safety assessment of the NCS by saying that based on the current existing data, there is no evidence of sensitization for the natural complex substance. However, if there is positive data, we would say that based on weight of evidence, that the NCS is a sensitizer, and we would need to assign it a no expected sensitization induction level, or NESL. This NESL value is expressed in, as micrograms per centimeter squared. To quickly get into what the NESL is, it is a dose that is obtained through the confirmation of no induction in human or CNIH testing, at which no induction of skin sensitization is expected to occur in humans. At RIFM, we like to stress that this is not the absolute no effect level, but rather a no effect level that lies somewhere below the threshold that is required to cause the induction of skin sensitization. Going back to the NCS evaluation, when there is not sufficient data, whether that means that there is insufficient data, limited, or no data available, the path forward will be the same. When consumer exposure is below a certain level for which there are no adverse health effects, then no additional testing is required. That level is the threshold of toxicological concern, or TTC. For skin sensitization, this is called the Dermal Sensitization Threshold, or DST. The DST for both reactive and non-reactive materials are levels below which there is no appreciable risk for the induction of dermal sensitization. These levels are based on data and the probabilistic analysis of potency data for a diverse set of chemical allergens. For non-reactive DST, this threshold is 900 micrograms per centimeter squared, and for reactive DST, it is 64 micrograms per centimeter squared. For NCS evaluation, we use the reactive DST as it is a more conservative threshold. If the whole NCS exposure is below the DST, then we are able to say that the NCS is safe under the current declared levels of use and we can end the evaluation process there. However, in the event that the NCS exposure is above the reactive DST threshold of 64 micrograms per centimeter squared, we would need to continue our evaluation with a component-based analysis of the NCS. For the component-based analysis, each component of the NCS is evaluated based on existing data, the application of read across, or the non-reactive or reactive DST. We conduct this analysis on all components which are present in the natural complex substance at a concentration greater than or equal to 0.1%. Now that I have reviewed the overall process, I wanna get a little more specific with a case study. In the next couple of slides, I will walk you through the step-by-step -step evaluation process of an NCS pedigree mandarin oil. So for step one, we start by evaluating all available data on the whole NCS. For pedigree mandarin oil, there are no available data within the RIFM database. We will need to note in our safety assessment that there are no data available, and then we will continue with the next step the application of reactive DST. The exposure for pedigree mandarin oil is above the threshold for reactive DST of 64 micrograms per centimeter squared. Therefore, we would need to continue with a component-based analysis of pedigree mandarin oil. 
We begin the component analysis using the composition data. For Pettigrain Mandarin Oil, 99.89% of the composition is made up of materials that are present at a concentration of 0.1% or greater. In total, there are 22 individual materials that are present at this concentration. Of these 22 materials, 5 out of 22 have sufficient data that show there is a potential for sensitization. There is an extra step required for component sensitizers, and I'm going to discuss that in more detail later. 11 of the 22 materials that make up pedigree oil have sufficient data or read across to demonstrate that there is no evidence of sensitization. The remaining six materials with a concentration of 0.1% or greater, according to RIFM composition data on pedigree mandarin oil, have either limited, insufficient, or no data available. They also have no applicable read across, and therefore we need to continue our evaluation with the next step of applying reactive or non-reactive DST to these materials. All six of these remaining materials are below the threshold of either 900 or 64 micrograms per centimeter squared and therefore are considered safe under the current declared levels of use in the context of the safety assessment of pedigree mandarin oil. However, in the event that there is a component that is above the DST, doesn't have read across, and doesn't have data, we would need to conduct testing either on the whole NCS or on the specific component that does not clear DST. So as I mentioned, pedigree mandarin oil has 22 components that are at a concentration of 0.1% or greater. Half of these materials have sufficient data and show no evidence of sensitization including the most abundant material, which accounts for half of the composition. I also mentioned that the sufficient data may come from a read across. We apply read across when insufficient, limited, or no target data are available on a given material. We work with RIFM chemists, as well as chemists who serve on the expert panel for fragrance safety to determine whether or not we can use a structurally sim similar material to clear a given material. In this case, the material P-cymine does not have sufficient data, but it is able to use data on a structurally similar material, Q-mine, as read across. You can see here the structure of both the read across and the target material are very similar. We bring these two materials to our chemists and our expert panel to make sure that there are no concerns for reactivity based on the difference between the two structures. If it is approved, we are able to use this as read across in our safety assessment. The next material is alpha pyanine, which is the most abundant sensitizer in pedigree mandarin oil. As I mentioned earlier, component sensitizers require one extra step, and in this case, Alpha pyanine is considered to be a sensitizer with a nestle of 7,000 micrograms per centimeter squared. What we need to do in this extra step is calculate derived exposure of the component. This is done by multiplying NCS exposure, P95%, by the typical composition of the component, which in the case of alpha pyanine is 2.6%. We are doing this to show that the component sensitizer has a derived exposure that is considered safe under the current use levels in the context of this specific NCS, pedigree mandarin oil. After we calculate the derived exposure shown here in the middle column, we benchmark this exposure against maximal acceptable concentration or MAC values in finished products. The MAC value is based on the Nestle, reference dose, and predicted skin absorption values. The maximum acceptable concentrations are listed here and are calculated for the IFRA product categories. This table is available in the safety assessment 
because we provide tables in the skin sensitization section for the most abundant sensitizer, alpha pinene, and the most potent sensitizer. What we want to show here is that the maximum acceptable concentrations are greater than the derived exposure. And in this case, for all of the IFR product categories, the derived exposure for alpha pinene is lower than the maximal acceptable concentration. And therefore, we are able to conclude that alpha pinene is considered safe under the current use levels in the context of pedigree mandarin oil. The most potent sensitizer, according to our composition data on pedigree mandarin oil, is citrol, which has a nestle of 1400 micrograms per centimeter squared. This is evaluated in the same way that we evaluated alpha pinene, in which we begin by calculating that derived exposure. In this case, citrol is present in 0.14% of the mixture. So we will use the NCS exposure P95% and that typical composition data to get our derived exposure values, which are seen here in the fourth column. And then we will benchmark that derived exposure against the calculated MAC values. Maximum acceptable concentrations for each product category are based on the lowest maximal, maximum acceptable concentrations based on systemic toxicity, skin sensitization, or any other endpoint evaluated in the safety assessment. For citrol, the basis of these MAC values was a reference dose of 0 0.6 milligrams per kilograms per day, a predicted skin absorption value of 80%, and a skin sensitization nestle of 1400 micrograms per centimeter squared. In this assessment, all of the components with a nestle had a derived exposure that was considered safe under the current use levels in the context of pedigree and mandarin oil. So again, what that means is that these maximum acceptable concentration values are going to be greater than the derived exposure for each of the product categories listed here in this table. And then we can say that under these use levels, Citrol is considered to be safe in the context of the safety assessment of pedigree and mandarin oil. So I mentioned that for clearing materials, we're able to use data and read across, but if none are available, we can also clear the materials by applying DST. In this case, this material is using the non-reactive DST of 900 micrograms per centimeter squared. And this material will be using the reactive DST of 64 micrograms per centimeter squared. So although pedigree mandarin oil has no data on itself and it does not clear reactive DST, using this component-based analysis that I just walked you through, we are able to show that pedigree mandarin oil is not a concern for skin sensitization and that no further testing is required. The 22 components all are considered safe and therefore pedigree mandarin oil itself is considered safe. Thank you so much for coming to this presentation. Once again, my name is Mara Lavelle. My email is mlavelle -L -L -E at riffum.org if you have any questions or want to get in contact with me. I appreciate all of your questions and I'm eager to answer more in our breakout session where you can meet with Danielle and I and ask us your questions directly or just chat with us. Once again, this breakout session will follow immediately after the conclusion of this presentation. Thank you so much for joining us.